morning, everybody. How are you? Great. It's um, lovely to be here together in the presence of the Lord and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We also love to um, acknowledge. <laughs> We'd also like to say a big hello to those. Who To those who are watching us um, as the, the message is being streamed this morning. And a special thank you to anyone who might be new here today. Or um, We'd love to, you to know that you're very welcome and we'd love to have you come back again and visit us again. Or even make this our, this church your permanent spiritual home. Um, I'd like to uh, say a special thank you also for the children. Now I don't see any, oh we have some little ones, a very little one, <laughs> with us. But uh, there will be children also. Oh, they're sick with COVID. Oh dear. Bernie's pulling us in there now. Kids that are normally here are actually sick with COVID at the moment. So we can be praying for those at home that they'll be coming to us soon too. Okay. Well, as we, um, I'd just like to mention too that for those who are, are new and aren't aware just yet of, of everything that's happening in the church life, um, your actual um, place to go to is the In Touch. Um, it will normally be sent out to you via email. It's only those who don't have an email address or would, um, there are paper ones that will be produced and um, popped up on the greeters table as you come into. So do make certain that your name goes down if you're not already receiving one so that you can know what's happening. Well, I think as uh, we now come together to, to worship, um, we'll just um, pray and, and seek the Lord's presence and his blessing upon our time with him today so that... Um, Everything that we do and say today might be pleasing to him. So we meet now as a family in the presence of our Heavenly Father. We meet as brothers and sisters in Christ, accepting the responsibility that this place is upon us to love one another as you have loved us. We meet as your lights in this dark world and we pray that through our words and our lives, others might be drawn into your family and accept you as their Saviour and Lord. Amen. Well, we have going into a time of announcements now, and we do have quite a few announcements again this week, so just... Um, Listen carefully. You may have already read them in the In Touch, but if not, just a quick reminder for you. Um, there's a meeting um, being held this after today, straight after church, for all those who want to be involved in the future children's work within the service. If you're interested or want to hear a little bit more, please stay for that meeting. It's been postponed a few times, but it will be held today, straight after the meeting, the, um, the service. And rosters, Jean's put a notice in there about um, they're looking for volunteers. We are for the next roster. That's the period from the April of the 24th to June the 26th. And um, a new roster will also be put into place after that one, after our new Pastor Gary Drummond has um, settled in. So if you'd like to be involved in any areas of ministry, put your name down on the list at the greeters table. And uh, even if you're already on a roster, pop it down there too so they, people know that who are making up the rosters that you're still available. Now we also um, have a couple of fundraisers coming up to assist those locally um, with flood relief. And there are a number of our families within our, our uh, congregation that have been affected. But um, the first... Um, uh, event, I think that's the word, that we'll be having is on Saturday the 2nd of April at 10 o'clock here in the church hall. And that's going to be a uh, morning tea and indoor bowls. So it should be a lot of fun. So even if you're not a bowler, come and have a bit of a laugh <laughs> and enjoy it. And, uh, that's, uh, and donations will be going towards financial support. And that will be followed later in May as well too. Just a little bit of advance warning for a hot pot night in the church hall. So if we just come at six o'clock um, for a 6.30 meal, that will be just $5 per head um, or a donation of your own choice if that's <clears throat> not possible for you. So come along and support our flood release fundraisers there. 
Now we've just got a couple more. Um, there is a, a beautiful chair that's um, recently recovered and, and refurnished chair. It's still available. If any of our church flood victims require a comfortable chair, just contact Jean in the office and um, you'll be able to uh, use that if you're able to. And I think just a reminder to everyone that there is a um, prayer meeting always in the chapel at 8.30. If you're able to be here at that time, that would be lovely if you'd like to join in just for 15 minutes before the service starts. But also, um, if anyone has a need for prayer, there'll be someone always rostered in the little chapel at the back there um, uh, to meet those needs and to pray with you for any concerns that you might have after the service every week. Okay, then I guess that's all there is at the moment. And then we'll, um, we'll move on now into a time of prayer for confession. So we'll just uh, quiet in our hearts now and we'll come before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we lower our heads before you and we confess that we have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we carry on our lives as though you weren't there and we fall short of being a credible witness to you. For these things we ask your forgiveness and we also ask for your strength to be, do better next time. Give us clear minds and open hearts so we may witness to you in our world. Remind us to be who you would have us to be, regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. Hold us to you and build our relationship with you and those that you have given to us here on earth. Amen. Right, that's a great message for us all. Um, we are now going to um, take up the offering and thank you to those who are available to do that for us now and then we'll um, pray after the offering's collected. Thank you. I thought we'd just pray together here now and then I'll take the bags up. <laughs> thank you. Right now, let's pray and thank God. Lord Jesus Christ, Thank you that you have plans for us that for our good and, our, and your glory. You said, give and it will be given to you. For in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give to you today as a response to your goodness to us. We ask that you receive our offerings and continue to supply all our needs. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace be in our words your love be in our hands 
and your joy be in our souls. In your mighty name. Amen. Thank you, June. Good morning. Our reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful that the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And now let us pray. As we consider the words of today's reading, Lord, we pray that you will open our hearts and eyes to find ways of showing kindness to others, ways in which we can show your love to all we meet, no matter their circumstances. May we learn to genuinely forgive others who have hurt us in some way, to show generous love so that they may see Christ through us. Lord, we ask for your help and guidance in our efforts to truly be your messengers. This is a big ask at times, Lord, but with confidence, we know that with your help, it can be achieved. Amen. Good morning, church, both here and wherever you are out there, watching in various parts in Australia, so good to be here together and gathered together by that fantastic invention of the internet that, (laughs) yeah, well, serves us well sometimes, doesn't it? Other times it can be quite annoying. Well, we come today (coughs) to conclusion of our study this great passage in Colossians. I would encourage you to each, through this week, read those 17 verses. Let them hang together. Let them infiltrate your spirit and see what God might teach you through them. But today we come to what I've called wardrobe two. We looked at wardrobe one, which is the things we take off, But now we come to the positive wardrobe too we put on. As I said a number of times during this this series, even though our study each week is focused on just a few verses, the whole passage is a progression. In fact, the whole book is a progression. You actually read it in about 10 minutes. And if, if you do it at night and you're feeling tired, read it standing up, not sitting in bed. Keep you awake that way. 
But the whole of the book's worth a, worth a good read, it really is. If I was here for longer, we might have done the whole book, but read it for yourself. But certainly those 17 verses in, in chapter 3, they're so important, with, with full of... I mean, we, we should be, and I am so grateful for the Apostle Paul. If we only had the Gospels, yes, we could focus on Christ, but Paul in his letters and Peter and, and John spread out, enlarge on. It's their reflections on the life of Christ over the years as they minister and grow. And so we learn so much more through what they've written than what Jesus actually said. It really brings it home to us. So the whole passage is a progression which makes up a complete idea as Paul challenges those new believers in Colossae to let their whole lives be a witness to their discipleship. To totally change the way they had lived so that the way they lived made the world a better place and witness to their faith in Jesus Christ. That as citizens of the kingdom, they are to live, as I said in one of the earlier series, beyond normal. I like a little wriggle. Gets your attention, doesn't it? Well, I hope it does. <clears throat> live beyond normal. Live differently the way they lived before they became disciples. As I highlighted before, Paul's teaching is consistent with, what, with the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Paul expands and puts into practical terms what Jesus had to say. Blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are comforted, merciful. They're worth reading too in, in, Mark chap, in Matthew chapter 5 about with the salt of the earth. If a salt's lost its flavour, then what good is it be thrown out? We're the light of the world and you don't cover a light, otherwise it's useless. You open it up so people can see the light and through us see the light of Jesus. So Paul's teaching is consistent and you need to always check with the rest of the Bible to make sure it is consistent teaching. Remember in other places Jesus said his disciples were in the world but not of the world. And here in these 17 verses, Paul actually spells out what that means. Paul's reflected on the words of Jesus. That here's what it means, folks. You're in the world, yes. You are citizens of two kingdoms. Remember Paul spelled that out? We're citizens of Australia. We have a passport that we use to travel. But we're also citizens of God's invisible kingdom and our passports are eternal our passports to heaven to eternal life with him passport that never runs out so Paul has expanded on Jesus words and he also said in the world his disciples will suffer Jesus never sugarcoated it I really get annoyed with ministers who do, who say, just come to Christ and life's going to be fantastic. Wish it was. <laughs> Jesus never sugarcoated it. In the world you will have tribulation. The world hated me, he said the world will hate you. We've seen so much evidence of that over the years. We're lucky in Australia at the moment. They hated me, he said, they'll hate you. And I can imagine what the believers in Colossae were going through as their friends, their family who hadn't come to Christ, their neighbours witnessed a change in their lifestyles. And you know, if people witness a change in your lifestyle, they feel guilty. They really do. I grew up with a, a bunch of kids. We, we, we probably wouldn't have been called a wild bunch, but 
we probably weren't living according to the standards of Jesus Christ. So we weren't a bad bunch, but we were a bit wild. We certainly didn't live up to Paul or Christ's standards. And once I became a disciple, I never said anything to condemn them. I never said anything at all, but they noticed a change in my lifestyle. And gradually, I wasn't invited to parties anymore. Gradually, I didn't go with them anymore. It wasn't a choice I made. It was a choice they made. They couldn't cope with the change in my lifestyle. One of the things I realised was I was on the way to become an alcoholic. So I gave up grog altogether. They held me down and tried to pour beer down my throat because they couldn't cope. I never said they were doing the wrong thing, never once. Just my lifestyle had changed. I can imagine the people in Colossae as their lifestyle changed. I mean, right throughout the empire, they martyred them because of their lifestyle. They hunted them out and killed them because of their lifestyle. We get it easy. But the people in Colossae that Paul's writing to, they wouldn't have got it easy. I've often heard it said, once a mature age person becomes a disciple, they desert their old crowd, which is a bad thing because they should stay and witness to the others. In my case, I wasn't an option. I became a pariah, cast out. You know, there's some word, things in the Bible I've always struggled with, especially in some of the words of Jesus. I know we shouldn't, but sometimes I have. I've struggled to understand a strange thing Jesus said in Matthew 12, 46 and 50. He spoke words which I have always thought were insensitive and hurtful to his mother and his siblings. They were outside waiting for him. It was probably a gathering to hear him teach. When he was told they were waiting, he said this. I just find these strange words on on the words, on the lips of Jesus. But to the one who told him, Jesus replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. I always thought that was aimed at, but it's not really. It's aimed at those he's talking to. He's saying, if you live the life that I am exampling and teaching, then you are my brothers and sisters. You're part of the kingdom. And I only realised that was as a preparing is Hey, here's, here's one of those, you know, light bulb moments. Boom! Jesus wasn't having a go at Mary and his brothers. He was simply saying to the group there, live like my disciples and you are my mother and my brother and my family. He says the same to us today. Live as my disciples and you are my brothers, my sisters, my mother, my father, my parents, my family. Living by kingdom standards, you are my family. And by implication, what Jesus and Paul taught is also a challenge to all believers for the last 2,000 years. And they come down that 2,000 years to us right here now in Sandgate. Live like this, and you are my brothers and my sisters and my family. So Paul, having established in verses 1 to 4 that believers are now to live in two realms, one being the reality of citizenships within their society, and the second as citizens of the kingdom, and the difference is to be shown in the way they live and interact through their morals, their ethics, and the way they treat others within the community on a daily basis. Last week I called it Wardrobe One. As Paul talks about what we are to take off, the old suit of clothes. Wardrobe One was taking off the suit of unethical, immoral clothes, the clothes of no compassion, the clothes of no love. Because mostly if you live in unethical and immoral ways that the Bible talks about, it's because of self-love. It's pleasing yourself. It doesn't matter what you do to others. 
It's pleasing you. It's the me world. Jesus knew about that all that time ago, the me world now. If it feels good, do it. You owe it to yourself. Listen to the ads on TV. You owe it to yourself. If it feels good, do it. doesn't matter what consequences for others. And the suit of clothes that Paul says take off are those selfish clothes to treat us as first and nobody else is worth anything. Paul explained in verse 5, put to death. I mean, I'm just saying take it off. He's saying put it to death. Therefore, whatever in you is earthly. And he, and he can't mean ignore this beautiful creation God's given us. He simply mean the way we live, the way we treat others. I don't know whether you guys believe in personal demons, but I do. He's saying, put off those things the devil would lead you to do. I don't see a demon behind every headache or every bush, but I believe in evil in the world. And I believe there's an evil force that drives it. I mean, how, how can you not when you think of Hitler and World War I? When you think of Putin and what's going on in, in... If there isn't evil in the world, then why is it happening? The results of evil in the world. Take off those clothes... I didn't label the negative because of what we put off, of what we put off, because we're grown up in the culture that, if not in practice, at least in theory, knows what the unhealthy and unchristian habits Paul lists are, and know they should be avoided. Paul had to listen for the Colossians because that was their way of living. It had been their normal life, so he had to point out these are the things you need to get rid of. The negative, get them out of your lives. They are to be avoided. Because in their culture, that was the normal. And Paul says, live above the normal. Live beyond the normal. Live as citizens of God's kingdom. So he had to do that before raising and listing the positives. And now we get to the positives in wardrobe two. I've got to tell you, that's not a photo of my wardrobe. <laughs> I would not put a photo of my wardrobe up there. Suicide's all right. Mine's not that neat and tidy, I can tell you. But anyhow, that's another story. But wardrobe too, the things we are to put on each day, and because these are not new to us, it might not have the same impact on us that it had on the Colossians. It's easy to forget what life was like before Christ and the impact on the betterment of humankind as the gospel spread and was adopted throughout the Roman Empire. If you can cast your mind back to last week, I talked about how the value of human life came into the world through the teachings of Christ. The value of infants became important. The value of old people became important. And how now we're reverting it back with our, our, our so-called um, assisted dying laws and the abortion up to 22 weeks. We're losing that love, that compassion, that understanding of the value of human life. Let's never forget Jesus was a revolutionary. Remember once when I, I'd only just started, wasn't even a theology college and Bible college and I was in a two church circuit where I had to look, look after one church and the minister had the big church down the other end. But once a month he'd get me to preach down there and I got up one Sunday night I said something about, Jesus not a revolutionary. Boy, did I get hauled over the coals by some of them after that. Jesus was a revolutionary. I was mean, didn't come out with guns and shoot people. But he's a social revolutionary. Jesus changed the world. It took a lot of years for it to happen. And it's taken a lot of years for it to revert. 
But Jesus was a social revolutionary and he changed the world. His teachings were so revolutionary that they crucified him and they persecuted his followers for over 300 years and they're still being persecuted in many parts of the world today. The teaching and witness of Christian standards, especially of love and fair play for all people, challenge the status quo even today. And that can never be ignored by people in power. As we often seen in totalitarian states, such as the USSR under communism, Germany under Hitler and the Nazis, and China today, with persecution perpetrated not just on Christians, but on every group who are different. You can't be different in a totalitarian state. And Christians were different in Colossae, in Rome, in Philippi, and they suffered because of their difference. And they're suffering today because of their difference. This whole new wardrobe of Chris. Chris Christly, give me tongue right now, well, of Christly possibilities is a wonderful promise. And we can imagine what a difference and how much better the world would be that we're living in right now if they were universally embraced. We can be clothed with qualities that resonate with the fruit of the Spirit. Just, just look at those and say, what a different the wor- place the world would be if we could all embrace that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There'd be nothing going on in Ukraine right now if Putin had exercised any of those. Instead of greed and self-engrandisement, And it's 2,000 years history, even back beyond that. The fruit of the Spirit. Just look carefully at the five virtues Paul lists in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, here's the new clothes, close yourselves with compassion. Thanks, Dougie. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Hands up if you show those every day. Gee, I'm glad you're all honest. (laughs) I got my hands well and truly down. Because as with the fruits of the Spirit, they are not natural to our natural inclinations. They're not, are they? Sue comes in and grumbles and I'm very kind and humble and say, yes, you're right, love. (laughs) No, I don't. (laughs) My back gets up and I retaliate. Not that she ever does it, by the way. That's just imaginary. (laughs) They're not natural. They are the fruit of the Spirit. They come from God's spirit living with us and we're to put them on each day in the power of his spirit. Nobody in the pre-Christian world thought these were virtues and many don't today. Notice there's not one obvious human ambition listed. There's nothing in there about being the top of the heap. There's nothing there about getting all the riches in the world. It's all about giving. I mean, I'm not saying you can't be the top of the heap. That's a different matter. I like to be the top of the heap too sometimes. Don't make it often, but I like to be there sometimes, especially on the golf course. Nothing wrong with getting riches, especially if you use them for God's work. We need it. But there's not one natural human ambition listed in that list. Paul spells out a startling new way of living. Compassion heads the list. 
for it's a peculiarly Christian word of deep sensitivity and tenderness towards those suffering. I witnessed the compassion was gobsmacked by the, the compassion this congregation showed a few weeks ago and is still showing in the way they're helping those through the disastrous floods. I'm gobsmacked to see this small, and you are a small church, group of people can be so generous and show so much compassion. I'm not sure I would have, but corporately you did. And I'm letting everybody know because God's compassion needs to be shared. When we do something in the name of Christ, we need to let people know. Not because of us, but because of the compassion of Christ. Nobody has modelled compassion as Jesus did. And compassion is accompanied by the rest of them. Kindness, humility, gentleness or meekness, and patience. These Christly qualities radiate beauty and build relationships. And notice Paul spells out in verse 13 the results that can be achieved by these qualities. Bear with one another. But as a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Then in verse 14, following the metaphor of closing, we find an overcoat, something that binds all these virtues together. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Above all, love, binding it together. Agape love or agape love, the uniquely Christian love, Agape, to quote the experts in the Greek New Testament language, is unconditional love. It is, to quote another, highest form of love, charity. Another, it's the love of God for man and man for God. It embraces a universal, unconditional love that transcends and persists regardless of circumstances. According to the letter Paul wrote, to 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5, it comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. It goes beyond just the emotions to result of seeking the best for others. And that works at so many levels. So many marriages of where I've tried to counsel people fail because they go with a me attitude. If in a marriage just on its own, you put the interests of the others first, you, feel, you benefit for it, I can tell you. Any relationship, if a boss puts the interests of his workers ahead of himself, he'll get a better result. If the workers are fair dinkum and put their interests ahead of the boss, Everybody gets a better result. It's not just in the Christian church. It goes right throughout any of our relationships. If you put the other first, you benefit. It goes beyond the emotions. Putting on these qualities is essential for humanity to live in peace and especially for Christians to grow together in Christ-likeness. The quickest way to destroy unity and peace with it be it in the church, the nuclear family, or indeed the world, and again, witness the war between Russia and Ukraine, is to act in ways opposite to this list, to act with unkindness, with pride, with harshness, with impatience. They destroy relationships at a stroke, and I would add selfishness. And I believe the best way to sum up and bring this series to an end is not with my words, but with the very words of Scripture themselves that we've looked at in Colossians. Bear with one another. 
if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. Didn't Jesus say, if you don't forgive, I can't forgive? But that's another topic. So you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything else together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All this teaching about a daily choice of Jesus involves everything we think, we say and do. One of the benefits of a regular quiet time each day with the Lord involves choosing Christly clothes to put on to wear through the day. Amen. We now come to a time of um, prayer for the world and for others. And already this service, there have been many things that have been shared that for prayer. We think of those who are unwell amongst us, particularly children and others who have COVID. And um, our hearts go out to, to all those battling with both sickness and uh, depression, sadness, loneliness, regrets. But Jesus knows exactly where they're at and will come now to bring them before him now. Dear Heavenly Father, there is so much wrong in our world. Most is our own doing, most because of our choices. A lot of suffering and injustice is a result of human unkindness, yet some is not. Disease and misfortune strike both faithful and unfaithful, and the world is not how you would have it, and life is so often not as we would have it. Have mercy on us, Lord. We think at this time of all who suffer, all who are afflicted, all who are attacked or suffering in war-torn areas, all who are disadvantaged or oppressed, those who are unwell, afraid, displaced or homeless, fearful, facing an uncertain or difficult future. And we pray, Lord, to give them hope and call us again to work for their good, whether overseas or even close to home working to do our bit with compassion for the poor, the displaced, those in despair, those who are either stressed, those despised, those unhappy or depressed, those frail of mind, body or spirit. Please be at work also in all those within our family here, our own families, our church family, and our extended community. May we pray and work for each other's good and most of all show your love to those around us indeed in need. We think also of a few among us, those with COVID, the children. We think also of Kathy and Patricia still recovering and uh, Pastor Ron and Lorna Holt, Zella, Graham and others not only with those with health issues, but also those who are still in recovery from the flooding. Please bring your healing, your comfort, and your hope to them, and help us to do whatever we can to be an answer to this prayer. Amen. Oh, sorry, we need to stand up. It doesn't matter if you fix it, stand up, I don't care. God doesn't care either, really doesn't. They'll know we are Christians by our love. 
Go in peace, but on those clothes that share that love in your community. May the peace of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, folks.